Hello, everyone. My name is Jackson Newman, and I'm an Education and Communications Fellow here at the Aldo Leopold Foundation. I would like to welcome you all to the Leopold Week 2022 Speaker Series. Thank you for tuning in. We are incredibly excited about the set of speakers who have come together to share this year's theme, Explore Your Sense of Place. In this session, photographer and sustainability social scientist, Dr. Edgar Cardenas, will discuss how art forms such as painting and photography have shaped our attitudes towards the land and share his attempts to communicate a more sustainable ethic in his own photographic practice. Leopold Week continues after tonight though, so catch Nick Offerman tomorrow night as he discusses his conservation ethic in the context of Leopold and Wendell Berry. We encourage you to stay involved and join our thinking community. We are doing book giveaways this week, so check us out on social media to see how you can get involved. Throughout the event, we would like to encourage you to participate using the chat function below. Be sure to set your message to the everyone option so that we can all join in on the conversation. If you have a question specifically for Edgar, whether about Leopold, about his photography, or anything else that piques your interest, please use the Q&A option below so that your question can be marked for a Q&A session at the end. Those who participate within the chat in Q&A will be entered to win a copy of Edgar's book, Between Two Pines. But now, a little bit about Edgar before I hand the stage over to him. Last summer, I began to work on my own photographic project at the Leopold Foundation. Previously, I read Edgar's book, Between Two Pines, and become familiar with his work and his connection to Aldo Leopold. As a result, I reached out to Edgar. I literally just sent him a message out of the blue to see if he'd be willing to serve as a mentor on my project. Over the course of the year, Edgar has been an incredible resource and teacher to me, forcing me to challenge my preconceived notions about nature and storytelling. So who is Edgar? Edgar holds a PhD in sustainability from Arizona State University and works at the Art Science Interface. He grew up in Broadhead, Wisconsin, just south of Madison, but didn't learn of Aldo Leopold until he moved to Arizona. His book, Between Two Pines, lays out how informed, engaged, lays out an informed, engaged argument that artist-scientist collaboration is essential for addressing complex environmental challenges that we face today. As an interdisciplinary artist, Edgar's work investigates the tangled cultural, ecological, and political subtleties of human land relationships. Ultimately, his work emphasizes the need for close relationships and with, with everyday ecologies as a method for showing what is obvious but often overlooked, that we are not separate from each other or our environments. Edgar is finalizing his second book, Meanwhile in Detroit, exploring his relationship to wildness in the city. Thank you so much for joining us today, Edgar. Thank you, Jackson. So let me go ahead and share my screen here with you. All right, so my goal tonight is to provide you with a framework for understanding how aesthetics is affected, how we engage with our environment. Sorry, one second. Pop-ups. How we engage with, how we, um, engage with our environment and how Leopold can help us rethink that relationship. I will do this by discussing how we have been influenced to understand land, wilderness in particular, and how Leopold repositioned the narrative in a very important way. I'll then share with, with you some of my photographic work deeply influenced by Leopold's ideas on how to engage with land. I wanna begin by telling you about an experiment that the Washington Post conducted regarding beauty and perception. This experiment takes place in a Washington DC metro station. A young musician sets up with his violin to perform for the morning commuters. However, he isn't your average street performer. This is Joshua Bell, one of the best violinists in the world. He regularly sells out in concert halls. Audiences are so respectful of his artistry that they will stifle their coughs with, uh, until the silence between moments. This is no ordinary violin either. It was handcrafted in 1713 by Antonio Stradivari during the Italian master's golden period when he had perfected his technique. No violin sound as wonderful as Strad's from the 1710s still, Josh states. The price tag for this perfection, three and a half million dollars. 
So the very best violinist with the very best violin. The twist, put him in one of the most average of places, not a concert hall, but a metro stop in the middle of rush hour and see how people respond. The question of interest, in a banal setting at an inconvenient time, would beauty transcend? I'm sure you're wondering, what does this have to do with Leopold or with sense of place? I'll get to that, but first we have to finish the story. Josh sets up in the metro station during the middle of morning rush hour, and for the next 43 minutes, he performs six classical music pieces for the thousand plus people that pass through the station. He begins with Bach's Chacon, which he considers one of the greatest pieces of music ever written and one of the most difficult violin pieces to master. The post isn't testing these hypotheses with popular tunes, but with masterpieces that have, entered, that have endured for centuries on their brilliance alone. Here, the post delves deeper into a philosophical debate that goes all the way back to Plato. Is the appreciation of beauty simply a matter of opinion? Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Or is it something more? Something measurable that we can agree upon? Is it a bit of both? The Washington Post writer argues that philosopher Immanuel Kant would say it's a bit of both, and he's obviously right. Beauty is beyond simple opinion. It has characteristics recognizable to others. The perceptual capability to recognize beauty also matters, but also context matters. In essence, the argument goes, Josh's performance is a thing of beauty. That's a fact. But can you recognize that beauty when it's right in front of you if the setting isn't right? The question of interest again, in the banal setting at an inconvenient time, would beauty transcend? More accurately, would anyone notice? Before I answer that question, would anyone notice? I want to note that I'm defining aesthetic and, that, and that's in its etymological context, which is derived from these two Greek words. I'm not gonna give you the, the, the Greek words, but I want you to know what they mean, right? To perceive by the senses or uh, by the mind and to be sensitive to. Sensitivity depends, uh, sensitivity deepens through direct and repeated engagement with the subject of interest. That matters. Let's use the Josh Bell story to explain. So of the thousand people that witnessed the performance, three people stopped to take serious note of his playing. That is besides children who would stop to listen as their parents would scoot them along. The first one is John. He says when he heard him play, I never heard anyone of that caliber. He was technically proficient with very good phrasing. He had a good fiddle too, with big lush sound. Now John doesn't recognize who Josh Bell is. He just knows the music. And when, when the uh, post asked him, you know, if he noticed anything unusual in that day, of the 40 people that they called and asked, he's the only one that mentions a musician. And they say, haven't you seen other musicians here before? It's not like this one. Right. Second, we have Janice. Janice is on her coffee break and she stops to hear Josh Bell play. She also doesn't know who Josh Bell is, but she says, I really don't wanna leave. And she knows that this person has a gift. Finally, we have Stacy. Stacy recognizes Josh Bell. She says, Josh Bell was standing there playing at rush hour. And people were not stopping, right? She knows the caliber of artist that Josh Bell is. So what does this have to do with aesthetics? Okay, so we find out that John is trained to be a concert violinist. He's trained until he's, until he's 18 before uh, uh, he changes careers. Janice also studied violin as a child. Stacy doesn't really know classical music, but she saw Josh play previously. Coming back to aesthetics, right? What do we perceive and how sensitive are we in that perception? Sensitivity deepens through direct and repeated engagement with a subject of interest. What we see here is that John has expertise in the space. So his ability to actually uh, think about the nuances um, are much uh, more in depth than the other two, right? He's never heard anyone of this caliber. He was technically proficient. He has good phrasing. He had a good fiddle too. He even notes the, the violin, right? He had a good fiddle. Janice knows she's seeing something special. She does, doesn't know who it is, but with her training, she understands that this is something special. Stacy has previous experience with Josh, right? Now, bringing it back to Leopold. Leopold notes that promoting perception is the only truly creative part. He also notes the successive stages, right? That the ability to perceive quality in nature goes through successive stages. 
Hence, at each stage, everybody can appreciate that those successive stages allow you to deepen that ability to understand and see, right, that sensitivity. Let's return to Kant. The Washington Post writer notes that Kant is obviously right when it comes to understanding beauty. Kant also writes on sublime, and this is where things get interesting for nature appreciation. Let's run through uh, the kind of how Kant graphs out these ideas of, of beauty and the sublime, right? So beauty is felt through the senses, through touch, smell, sight, uh, sound, and taste. So while beauty, while beauty is accessible to the senses, the sublime transcends them. The sublime is so overwhelming that the only thing to do is intellectualize the experience through acts of contemplation. This gets referred to as disinterestedness and equates to psychological and emotional distancing from the experience. Right? The, the beyond the senses experiences are transcendence, wonder, awe, uh, acts of sacredness, and even terror. Now Kant decides to put this on a spectrum beauty on one side, sublime on the other side. Here's where picturesque comes in, right? Picturesque becomes a mediator between beauty and sublime. In essence, the picturesque not only joins beauty and sublime, it provides a formal construction, a framework for how to intellectualize and how to appreciate nature. Through these acts of disinterestedness, one could not only, one could now, I'm sorry, one could now just as easily enjoy the rural countryside as well as the wildest of natural environments. Those with financial means would hire landscape designers to create a series of views, forcing nature to look more like a picture, more ideal. Right? This idea of the picturesque became so ingrained that the artists of the day, um, with the artists of the day, that nature now must follow the formal constructions of the picturesque to be appreciated. Right? So uh, a William Gilpin, who's one of the, the painters of the time, um, one of the famous picturesque painters of the time said that I'm so attached to my picturesque girls that if nature gets it wrong, I can't help putting her right. right? Hence, for nature to be truly appreciated, it must imitate art. Otherwise, it's not worthy of aesthetic contemplation. Now we have Thomas Cole, Oxbow here in Mount Holyoke. So Thomas Coles is the founder of the Hudson River School, and he notes that perhaps the most impressive characteristic of American scenery is its wildness. Historian Mark, Mike, Mark Spence notes that the idea of wilderness functioned as an important tool for patriotic apologists who felt compelled to refute European claims that the North American landscape was fundamentally flawed because it lacked ancient historical associations and refined pastoral landscapes. What American scenery lacked in European qualities, they argued, it more than compensated with an abundance of wilderness. So here, wilderness becomes very much a part of American identity. We still have a picturesque, but it's different. It's our own in terms of its wildness. So these formal constructions of nature appreciation following art are expressed in some of the aesthetic devices used at the time. This is a cloud glass. What you would do in order to go and appreciate a landscape is you would bring your cloud glass with you. And when you found a landscape that you thought was perfect, right? Picturesque in nature, you would actually turn your back to that, to that landscape and you would use this cloud glass to look over your shoulder at that landscape. Now these, these mirrors were slightly tinted dark and they were vignetted. So the idea was that in order to actually uh, see this like a painting, you would turn your back to the actual landscape and look at it in your glass. So you had this reflection of a painting uh, um, in, your, in your view instead. Now, the birth of photography amplifies and reinforces these ideas of American picturesque. While the American picturesque still followed the formal compositional properties of the European picturesque, they were uniquely American in their preference for the sublime. Rebecca Solnit notes that if American landscape photography has a birthplace and spiritual home, it's in Yosemite Valley. In fact, these images became instrumental in convincing Congress to dedicate Yosemite as the country's first federally created park. We see the similarities almost 100 years later, right? Adams, along with the Sierra Club, believed that photography could serve to promote wilderness preservation. The aesthetic of a choice would elicit the sublime in its effort to foster environmental reform. 
These ideas of the sublime illicit constructs of virgin wilderness, pristine and natural, and free of human intervention. So what's wrong with this idea, right? What's wrong with this American picturesque, this idea of sacred wilderness? Well, Cronin observes in his essay, The Trouble of Wilderness, that one only has to think of the sites that Americans choose for their first national parks, Yellowstone, Yosemite, Rainier, Zion, Grand Canyon, to realize that virtually all of them fit one or more of these categories. Less sublime landscapes simply do not appear worthy of such protection. He continues, the wilderness hides its unnaturalness behind a mask that is all the more beguiling because it seems so natural, right? That we mistake ourselves when we suppose that wilderness can be the solution to our cultural problematic relationship with the non-human world. It itself is no small part of the problem. Now, this isn't new to, to uh, uh, Cronin either, right? Leopold says the same thing, right? That there's those that are willing to be herded in droves through scenic places who find mountains grand if they be proper mountains with waterfalls, cliffs, and lakes. To such, the Kansas Plains are tedious. He understands this idea, this American picturesque, and is calling it out already. Rondell Partridge has a very different view of Yosemite. He happened to be an assistant to Ansel Adams uh, when Ansel Adams would come out and make these images. So we see that there's also a shift that other people are looking at some of these pictures or at some of these places with a different lens. There's a shift that's starting to emerge in the photographic world in the 70s. Photographers start pushing against these, these ideas of pristine wilderness. But Joe Deal uh, distilled one of the common sentiments from the new topographics. This was a body of work uh, by these photographers. And he says, when I actually went to Yosemite, it was like seeing everything in quotation marks. They were contesting these ideas of wilderness in the West. Uh, they shoot the man-altered West, but they hold on to the, an interesting component of Kant's ideas. Their photographic style is, character, is characterized as neutral, mundane, banal. They're happy to go forward with disinterestedness, a psychological distancing from the subject matter. In many ways, they shot everyday spaces, like what we're talking about, these everyday ecologies, but they maintain disinterestedness now in a neutral sense. That doesn't mean the American picturesque has just disappeared either. It still pervades much of the conservation aesthetic. These pictures are from the Instagram feed for the Department of Interior. We can see that a lot of these ideas of picturesque, a lot of the characteristics are still alive and well. And this is what we promote in terms of uh, um, identity as American identity. I took this one just a, a little while back here. Um, and it was a very, a really interesting one to me because um, they're, they're showing Horsetail Falls uh, at a particular time when the sun hits it just right and, and people start calling it firefall. Well, what is the focus of perception for the people that are coming here? Right? This is a behind scenes look at Horsetail Falls. So uh, my modern Met, which is a, a blog that is, is for arts, uh, spoke with a photographer at the event and the photographer noted that there were so many photographers there that it felt like a festival. The article also focused on how he captured the shot. The software used a very high resolution camera, a 600 millimeter lens and a 1.4 lens extender. They all perceive the beauty of the phenomenon, but where does the sensitivity lie? Perhaps in capturing the very moment the light hits the falls just right. Zafra, the photographer says that I found it fascinating how the colors in the wall kept changing with every passing second. It's not a sensitivity to the ecologies they're trampling. There was another article that came out uh, by Petapixel uh, titled Photographing Yosemite Falls, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And they noted that the Park Service has to actually block off certain areas because of the erosion that it causes from so many people coming to actually look at this and to photograph it. Again, Leopold, way before this, is understanding a lot of what's going on here. This is from Land Pathology, which he writes in 1935. He says, a few parcels of outstanding scenery are immured as parks, but under the onslaughts of mass transportation, their possible function as outdoor universities is being impaired by the very human need which impelled their, impelled their creation. Parks are overcrowded hospitals trying to cope with an epidemic of aesthetic rickets 
The remedy lies not in hospitals, but in daily dietaries. He's noting already that you have to think about the everyday spaces, your everyday ecologies that are going to be much more useful in your understanding and appreciation of land. So he's starting to transition from Kant in interesting ways because he still echoes the desire to connect the intellect, but it's transformed in Leopold's hands by scientific understanding. Where contemplation may have been enough for Kant, Leopold infuses that contemplation with a deeper scientific understanding of the land. Right? Appreciation of the picturesque is insufficient. We know this, he, he speaks about this often, right? That ecology brought about a new mental eye and that new mental eye brought about difference, a difference in perception. He also regularly speaks to the idea of the evolutionary context of these aesthetics, right? That that develops a deeper kind of appreciation for a place. He doesn't let off the artist either, right? He talks about the artist using these tropes over and over again, and that they ignore the dramas of ecology and evolution, which are rich for them to actually explore. This is from State of the Profession, another, uh, another essay from 1940. He says that in our profession and on its fringes are a growing number of painters and photographers who are also researchers. And he's hoping that this expands. On the other end, he also understands that even though we have to have an education, that the education isn't enough, right? That a PhD in ecology may become as callous as an undertaker to the mysteries at which he officiates. His solution is the departure that both uh, um, photography originally didn't have and that new topographics didn't have. It's a departure from the disinterestedness that Kant has actually put forward, right? And we see this in multiple ways that, you know, he talks about books on nature seldom mentioning wind because they're written behind stoves. He's pushing on this idea of deeper connection, right? That we can only be ethical in relation to something that we can see, feel, understand, love, or otherwise have faith in. Again, that it's inconceivable to him that you can have an ethical relationship to land without these components, without love, without respect, without admiration for the land. He says to modern man, land is the space between cities on which crops grow. Turn him loose for a day on the land, and, it's, and if it's not a golf course or a scenic area, he's bored stiff. So his ultimate objective, right? is to teach students to see the land, to understand what he sees, and to enjoy what he understands. Again, what do we perceive, and how sensitive are we in that perception? Sensitivity depends, uh, sensitivity deepens through direct and repeated engagement with the subject of interest. For Leopold, that's land. He's also noting that things can't be left to aesthetic priests, right? That acts of creation we normally think of are reserved for gods and poets, but all you need is a shovel to plant a pine and that you neither need to be a god or a poet to take on this creative effort. We all know this uh, uh, ethics, aesthetics, and ecology component of what Leopold has done, right? He speaks about it often. And so what the goal is then is not only to deepen our understanding of ethics, ecology, and aesthetics, but to coordinate them in an effort to align and deepen our relationship to land. I give you this, this quote before I kind of move into the images, right? That uh, it's fortunate perhaps that no matter how intently one studies a hundred little dramas of the woods and meadows, one can never learn all of the salient facts about any one of them. It's the title of my work, uh, of this body of work, 100 Little Dramas. And it really spoke in, uh, uh, to me in terms of how even a backyard can have a hundred little dramas that you cannot pay attention to. So this took place when I was in grad school and um, I had first moved to, to Tempe, Arizona and it was a new experience around how I was thinking about um, backyard and sustainability. What I'm gonna do is read you a couple of the expert excerpts for my uh, statement. I had kind of a long statement that was explaining um, how I was thinking about uh, this work. And so I'm just gonna read these for you. We all have a natural space we interact with daily. Typically, we thoughtlessly engage with a space using it in the same manner as it was first presented to us. The backyard, our private landscape, often gets no more than moving and mowing and weeding. Nonetheless, it is a space we touch regularly. 
My relationship to my backyard changed in August of 2009 when I moved into a rental home that had an inhospitable backyard of thorns and dust. With the exception of using it to let out the dogs and bring the garbage to the dumpster, it was as though it didn't exist. Then the winter rains came. I watched the backyard transform from dusty brown to brilliant green, from barren to fecund. Watching the tall grasses sway and the lizards do their push-ups on the fence, I realized that a wild space had been lying dormant and was now awake in my backyard. Perhaps all the backyards could be thought of as wild spaces if we just learned to see them. I wondered if personal sustainability could be studied in a space like this. As a doctoral student in the School of Sustainability, as what I was writing at the time, I'm continuously examining what sustainability means, how it's practiced and who practices it. In discovering the wilderness in my backyard, I initially considered questions like, beginning with the current state of one's own backyard, how does one go about changing it for the better? What would be considered better? What does personal sustainability look like? I was getting ahead of myself though. Before I could consider these questions, I had to first learn to see the land and my relationship to it. I had to set aside my utility oriented mindset and what I understood in theory. I needed to lead instead with curiosity and be open to the role exploration would play in this space. I reflected on how the processes in the backyard mimicked other perhaps larger ecological processes. Reflecting on this, I would think about things that Leopold would say like, the weeds in a city lot convey the lessons as, uh, convey the same lesson as the redwoods that the farmer may see in his cow pasture more than the scientists adventuring in the South Seas. This exploration led me on two journeys, attempting to articulate these experiences in ways that captured the dynamic relationships I was witnessing, and an inquiry into how we approach and think about our human environment relationships. In this work, I sought to intentionally blend the historic with the contemporary, to access the use of natural history and its reemergence in observational ecology approaches, and to express these sentiments in my work. Stepping back from the targeted questions of my discipline, my methods were informed by two questions. If Aldo, if Aldo Leopold were alive and in my backyard, how might he explore the space? How might he express the backyard's drama? The backyard proved to be larger than I expected, not in its physical length or width, but in the depth of complex relationships that were to be found in such a small space. Climbing atop ladders, crawling on my hands and knees, flipping over rocks and wood. I explored and engaged in and observed the yard intently for three years and still only scratched the surface of the activities taking place from microbial life in my compost to the seasonal habits of the lizards and birds to the feral cat predators leaving the bird remains in our yard. And this was merely the fauna. I was continuously intrigued and excited about the plant life growing in our yard. I would dig up creosote and brittle bush sprouts to replant. I would inspect the plants and food in the garden looking to see what was growing and what, and what the bugs were eating. I would check to see when the flowers were blooming, study the moths and bees pollinating, and then wait to collect seeds for the next season to initiate the exciting process again. Sometimes that perception comes to you from accidents. In making a mistake, you learn to see and sensitize yourself to environments if you stay open to learning. So I would also collect um, these reflections and I'll read this one to you as well. October 19, 2011. Last week, I was trying to pull an old pile of the trunk out of the ground. I had started, to, had started to decompose and was being stubborn coming out. So I kicked it with the bottom of my boot to loosen it. It worked. 
I picked up the piece of wood and found a gecko had already begun using the space. In kicking the tree stump, I had scraped skin off and broken her back. Not wanting her to suffer, I grabbed a large piece of wood and killed her. I went back to the hole the stump had left and found lizard eggs and a lizard, not much longer, larger than a fingernail, coming out of the ground. I had disturbed a nest. I put the piece of wood back, not knowing what else to do, but I was reminded of a story by Shonryu Suzuki. A student asked Suzuki Roshi why the Japanese make the teacups so thin and delicate that they break easily. It's not that they're too delicate, he answered, but that you don't know how to handle them. You must adjust yourself to the environment and not vice versa. How was a weed a book? Here's another reflection. September 10, 2012. I had seen one before and thought someone lost a pet. I didn't imagine I would see one again. One morning, Sandra calls me to come outside. Hurry, you're gonna to wanna to see this. I step outside and there it is, a peach-faced lovebird eating my sunflowers. I ran back inside for my camera, but he flew off before I could get a picture. To my joy, a few weeks later, the lovebirds found her home in mass. As many as 11 lovebirds would come every morning to feast on the sunflowers, and by eight, they would be gone. They stopped visiting once the sunflowers died, but I planted twice as many this year. I'm sure they'll return. As I noted, I started to really pay attention to the pulses of, of the space, of even though it was small as a backyard. I started to learn where uh, the, the lizards would lay eggs, but I also started to learn when they would hatch and where to be careful not to step in. These are lizard eggs, obviously. We often don't pay direct attention to the role of the sun, uh, of the sun in our landscape. Yes, we paint with light, uh, but it's also a life giver. Right? And the same sun that hits these national, these national parks is also the same sun that hits these backyards. So I started thinking more about that relationship between the celestial and the backyard. This is during an eclipse as well. Here's one more story. April 23rd, 2012. The other day I found a little flower in the yard. I didn't know its name, but it was the only one of its kind. Just this morning, as I was watering the plants, I saw it laying on its side. Seeing it broken off at the stem made my heart race, such a little thing, losing a flower. I could have lost any other flower in the yard, I probably wouldn't have even noticed. But this was another one. This was the only one. To lose that flower was to lose the possibility of any other like it in my yard. I suppose I could figure out what kind of flower it was and get more. But in that moment, all I could feel was that sense of loss. And it really reminded me of uh, Aldo Leopold's uh, A Monument to the Pigeon about the, about the passenger pigeon, right? That we grieve because no living man will see again the onrushing phalanx of victorious birds sweeping a path for spring across the marsh skies, chasing the defeated winter from all the woods and prairies of Wisconsin. Before the monsoons come in, in the Phoenix area, we'll get these giant dust storms to cover everything. A bouquet of hornworms. Having grown up in Wisconsin and now living in Detroit, you know, sometimes you think that a worm is such a small thing, such an insignificant thing. But when I first started in this backyard in Tempe, Arizona, we didn't have any worms, at least not in my yard. Um, so the, after two years, finding my first worm was such a big uh, moment of excitement for me that something had changed in that space um, that now was hospitable to, to being able to have worms. This is one of the final pictures from the exhibit. 
um, and, and what the yard looked like shortly before um, we moved out. And I'll finish with this final excerpt from, uh, from the statement. While ecology has taught us about the relationships and processes of natural systems, it has not conveyed the hundred little dramas that play out, the stories that make the principles salient in a visceral way. These qualities do not reveal themselves to us all at once either. We develop an often tacit understanding that is difficult to put into words, but can be hinted at with images. Susan Sontag points out that photographs alter and enlarge our notions of what is worth looking at and what we have the right to observe. I've decided to take another look at the backyard, one that aligns with Leopold's aspiration to integrate the ecological, ethical, and aesthetic and reintroduce this dialogue to our sustainability discussions. These observations are the delights and dilemmas of one who cannot live without wild things and has found them in the backyard. So I returned to this place. I returned to this house two years later after I had to move it out. And I knocked on the door and, and asked if I could see the backyard. I was curious uh, um, how it had changed. And to my surprise, it was a sustainability student that had moved in. And this is what the yard had become. It had come from this to this and finally to this. And it really brought home a point that, that Leopold kept nailing uh, on us, right? That he keep kept telling us about that no important change in ethics was ever accomplished without an internal change in our intellectual emphasis, our loyalties, affections, and convictions. Just knowing the science is not enough. So what does all this have to do with sense of place? Everything. Because if our primary mode of landscape appreciation is national parks, then there's very little left for everyday ecologies. If we lead with psychological distance as a prerequisite for appreciation, then we can't build relationships with land. These everyday ecologies are where you can find a sense of place. So I leave you with this. What do we perceive and how sensitive are we in that perception? Sensitivity deepens through direct and repeated engagement with the subject of interest. When discussing sense of place, that subject is our everyday ecologies. Okay. With that, I'll turn it over to Jackson, who is a Leopold Fellow and will share some of his work with us as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edgar. That was incredibly powerful. Um, so let me just take one second to get my uh, slides up. All right, and before I uh, jump into this, I just want to remind everyone that uh, please use the Q&A uh, function to uh, pose questions to Edgar, and after I finish my short presentation, uh, we'll go right ahead with that. So, uh, during my time here at the foundation, I've undertaken my own storytelling project on the Leopold Memorial Reserve. As someone who grew up feeling disconnected from the land, I wanted to connect with the space and photograph what I saw, felt, and experienced. I decided to focus on the area of the reserve called the slough. A slough is a swamp-like body of muddy, still water. In this case, it's backfilled from the nearby Wisconsin River and groundwater from the surrounding swamps and sandhills. As Edgar explained in his presentation, areas like the slough are often ignored when we think of nature, when we think of national parks. So I wanted to find beauty and intimacy in a place that didn't fit our traditional conception of the picturesque. Over the last six months, I've spent countless hours in this space. It's just a short walk down the road from where I live. And when I started this project, the picturesque was culturally embedded in me. And it remains to this day. I mean, you should see some of the things I post on Instagram, you know. But Edgar encouraged me to go with an open mind, uh, to use the camera as a tool of observation, to collect little stories and moments rather than pretty pictures. So today I would like to share a story with you all, uh, something that happened to me a couple months ago. Often I instinctively feel a paternal relationship to the ecological community. Born out of this well-intentioned idea that the land needs protection, I forget about the land's capacity to teach me. 
An encounter with a Blanding's turtle at the edge of the slough a couple months ago reminded me otherwise. So this photograph for con uh, is the slough in its context. The Leopold Shack would be just a few hundred yards uh, in the top right. The Wisconsin River is up here. Uh, this is a floodplain forest and the road is down here. So it's really an ecotone or the change between two different types of ecosystems. After fighting my way through thick undergrowth and almost losing my hiking boots to the mud a couple times, I made it to the edge of the slough. The mosquitoes, buoyed by recent rain and warm weather, and anyone who spent any time in the summer in Wisconsin can attest to this, uh, swarmed my neck with bloodthirsty exuberance. Here I sat down to watch the sunset. Although, real, although Leopold wrote, the modern dogma is comfort at any cost. This photograph is a reminder to me that comfort is not king. A distinct pleasure in wisdom can be found in embracing discomfort, like hiking through thick, deep mud and six inch boots when it's spilling over the sides and getting all over my socks. I began to photograph little moments, like how the light interacts with a lily pad or a cattail. At first, it felt like I was a disturbance to the natural order, but the longer I stayed and became accustomed to the land, the more the land welcomed me. And it welcomed me because I am, just like you, a part of the land. During my walk, I found the ruins of an old dock from the Leopold area, era. Understanding human and natural history has given me a deeper appreciation for what I observe. I know this place was loved and I know it was home to a community of people and creatures. After a few minutes sitting at the edge of the slough, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye and a Blanding's turtle emerged from the grass. Slowly and with great dignity, he plodded to a place a few yards away, never taking his eye off me. Together we watched the last rays of the summer sun catch the lily pads and puddles of water. In that moment, I wondered whether the appreciation of beauty was solely a human trait. Perhaps there is something universal, present in both turtles and humans, a feeling of wonder and love as yet captured by language. Now, it's easy to ascribe the turtle's behavior to a reptilian need to raise its body temperature through basking in the sun. And perhaps, and it probably was uh, how that turtle was experiencing the sunset. So as I sat there, I also closed my eyes and felt the summer sun warm my skin, absorbing its energy. But at the end of the day, there's so much that we do not understand, but I do understand deeply and intuitively that that turtle and I shared a moment as two organisms formed by the same evolutionary forces equally complex and beautiful. But the seasons change. And each week I still return to the slough. In the winter, it feels radically different. Once teeming with life in the summer, it has gone quiet. The cloven tracks of deer and the occasional twitter of a chickadee are the few reminders of a community in slumber. But as I cross the slough, hardened over with ice, I know that there's likely a turtle somewhere under my feet, deep in hibernation, waiting to emerge in the spring. So uh, this area, which I've been calling the slough, and to some degree Edgar's backyard, I don't think they're particularly special places. They're only made special by the time spent there. I can guarantee that almost everyone watching this right now has their own special place their own slew. So please let me know in the chat, where is your special place and why? What does it make you feel? What do you experience there? Aldo Leopold wrote, we can only be ethical in relation to something we can see, understand, feel, love, or otherwise have faith in. So I wanna conclude my portion of this presentation with a call to action. Go to your special place, 
meet the characters there like a Blanding's turtle, create relationships with them and tell stories about it to, to your community. Thank you. And now I'm gonna invite Edgar back on stage for some question and answer. So if you have questions, again, please use the Q&A function to ask them. All right, Edgar, here goes question number one. Does someone need fancy equipment like a nice camera to tell powerful stories about the land? What can I use instead? Um, I, I believe it was Eugene Smith that said, you know, the best camera to use is the camera you have. And uh, I, you don't, a, a phone can be a perfect camera to use. And the reason I think that even a phone can be a perfect camera to use is because what you're talking about is direct engagement with place. And so that means that you wanna be up close to experience that. And so even something as simple as a phone creates that. Um, I know we've had this conversation before as well that you know it, it's not just photography, it's direct engagement with place. Some people might sit there and write and that's engagement with place. Um, some people uh, want to record um, the ambient sounds and that's connection to place. But all those pieces are good. Um, I don't think you, you know, there's, there's no real recommendation in terms of, do I need a specific camera to do this? I think what you have is ends up being perfect. Great. And um, what role do family or other human members of the community play in your storytelling process? You know, it's even more in, in the new book that um, I'm writing, Meanwhile in Detroit, but I, I believe it was just yesterday, it was Kurt that had mentioned the, um, I think it was Kurt, um, had mentioned the quote that, you know, uh, Leopold's interest was in man's relationship to land and relationship to, to one another. And when we think about it as an entire community, you know, our family become a critical component of that sense of place, because that's where we experience um, a lot of our interaction with those places is in relationship to other people. So I think it's, I think it's really important. Um, the, the new book, Meanwhile in Detroit, is taking a lens through uh, my son's experience of being in place. And this also comes from um, uh, Nabin's book, uh, The Geography of Childhood, that really talks about how children experience um, nature in very different ways because they haven't been taught uh, formal constructions of how to appreciate nature and usually it ends up being a little plot you know, off in the corner where they can really explore. Same with with uh, the piece I was mentioning here with um, with Josh Bell, where the kids kept getting scooted off when they were listening to the music. Sometimes these constructions, these conceptions actually inhibit our ability to appreciate, um, whether it's uh, visually or, um, you know, through other, other methods. So family is a, a critical component of, of having that experience in that place. Definitely. So here's a more personal question for you also. Why did you want to study sustainability? When did you begin photography? And when or what in inspired you to explore the overlap between the two? I actually started with photography before I started the program um, within sustainability. Um, I, had, I had been um, very interested in conflict photographers, uh, like James Noctway was a person that actually got me started thinking about the role of photography and how could it influence um, change for the better. Um, but I also had picked up on the fact that so many of this conflict photography has such a limited time scale, right? You tell a story over a couple of weeks, over a couple of months. And I really thought about um, how we could have deeper conversations and deeper dialogue about sustainability challenges because they are so complex. You need projects that last years. And so when I started the program, I was already working as a photographer. Um, it was kind of central to the work that I had been doing. Um, and so I started the program and the very first semester, I went over to the art school as well. And Bill Jenkins and Mark Klett are two uh, professors there that welcomed me in and were kind of like, you know, how do we, how do we help you? How do we make this happen? Um, but my interest was, was right up front, you know, thinking that photography, art is a way of knowing. Right? It's a way of exploring and it's a way of thinking about a space very differently than um, the way we think about in terms of science. And one thing that I learned as we continued, as I continued in the program was that 
science was much more interested in human environment interactions. And it didn't as much think about human environment relationships. We talked a lot about the global challenges. We talked a lot about what we we're gonna do in a context that was very abstracted. Photography allowed me to bring back that direct connection of human environment relationships, right? Because as Leopold says, if, if there's no change in us around how we think about uh, what we're doing, it's very difficult, right? To go out there and say, these things need to, these things need to change. What's particularly interesting about taking kind of an in-depth study of the backyard is when I moved from that place, I ended up um, next to the uh, White Tank Mountains in, uh, on the edges of Phoenix. I saw that broader wilderness area, that, that um, range in a very different way um, than I had previously, having had that in-depth um, exploration of the backyard. Yeah, so how do you think, and this is from Griffin, how do you think photographs compare to witnessing a scene or event in person? I, there's something to direct experience. Um, but what I really like, and, and this is something again that Mark Platt had, had told me, is that you know when you think about imagery, you think about it in terms of it being data collection. So you might make 2000 images and then you look at those images and you say, what is the imagery telling me? And you think about how that gets sequenced and that sequencing tells a narrative, right? So direct experience is important to continue to uh, um, be in that space. There's nothing to, to kind of move you beyond that. That is necessary. But the work of, of making photographs and sequencing those photographs is a way of both contemplating and reflecting on an idea um, and thinking through those ideas kind of in a deep way. So I don't see the difference between both. Like, right, like I know that oftentimes imagery or photography is thought of as a way to document, but I don't think of photography as a way to document necessarily. Yes, it does document, um, but it's the sequencing of those images that creates a broader story, um, a broader narrative that allows you to reflect on it and create a dialogue because it's something that everyone can share to create a dialogue about how we wanna move forward. And I think that that becomes critical. I think that's how they're actually linked together. Yeah, and so this one comes from Colin. As a pr practitioner in urban land conservation, I love what you were describing, helping people reinterpret reinter the banal as sublime, even if it may not be picturesque. And I'm wondering, how do we help a large community to shift their understanding of where they live? You know, it's um, it's that quote early on that you know um, that Leopold has about successive stages of the pretty to the beautiful to things not un yet uncaptured by language. You know, and the example of Josh Bell too is we have Stacy who only recognized Josh Bell, and that was that was her entry point to appreciation. The, the best way that I can think of, and there's, um, we have a, um, a program, I know that's, that's more than just here in Detroit, but there's one that's called Black to the Land. And it's about getting kids that wouldn't normally be able to get out into um, wild spaces, even if they're in the city, to just explore them, right? And so it starts really, you know, people think of places as, as you know, banal, because they don't have an experience of how uh, nuanced it can be. Um, it's about getting people out, you know, into these spaces or just getting them started, right? That Leopold again says, all you need is a shovel um, to have an act of creation to plant a pine. You know, it can be with just starting a garden at home and, and exploring that, right? And those processes, um, all those little things. And I always say, start with little things because those little things is what sharpen and hone both that perception and that sensitivity. So if there's places or if you can bring nature to them in one way or another, um, I think those are always um, advantages to, to kind of opening that access for them. Right. Uh, this one is from Joanne. Do you make notes in the field or just hold your thoughts and feelings in your heart until you have the time to write about them? Um, so I make notes in the field. Um, but we've actually discussed this to um, uh, Jackson about what the imagery tells you. 
um, you know, and, and oftentimes when you think about sequencing imagery, what you'll do is say, I have this story in my head and I'm just going to put this narrative together and put it down. And, you know, even in discussing your work, we would go through that. Of, Let's look at more images. Let's see how they're connected. So I definitely say make notes in the field because they're also a moment of reflection when you look back at those notes and in terms of how you were thinking about that space. But there's also a lot of value in putting the images away for six months and coming back to them and seeing them new, uh, you know, and seeing them, you know, even when you change the sequence of imagery, um, they tell different narratives. Um, doing both is, is really um, a way of, of, again, contemplating and thinking through the work um, as a way of trying to figure out what you're after. Some things are just unconscious, right? You'll, you'll notice that you keep photographing similar things over and over again, and you notice you're paying attention to particular things. Looking at those images, you go out and you have, you have a new perception at that point in time of saying, like, what else do I need to photograph to think about the broader aspects of the space, whether it's different times of day, whether it's in different light, whether it's different areas, all these things can be thought of as ways of exploring uh, your space.